So I have to say that Dead Mount Deathplay, for as charming as it was, which really isn't a surprise given that, well, the author did work on Bakano and Lord help me, I always hate saying this, Dora ra ra I believe I got that right. Either way, I don't care. Either way, this show has a vibe that a lot of times is goofy and comfy, but it doesn't stop the messed up atmosphere, whether it was Corpse God and his entire backstory which kicks off the episode, or Misaki, who, man, I can understand what broke in her given what she experienced as a child, and the fact that prior to our boy Polka seemingly getting back up, at least from their point of view, she was actually going to off herself because she realized she was too messed up to probably exist in this world. And if it wasn't for that phone call saying, hey, at least finish your mission before you off yourself, yeah, she would have been dead. Man, this show has a lot going on for it. And while I do expect some people might say maybe the blend of comedy and I guess more silly atmosphere in the face of necromancy and death maybe isn't everyone's cup of tea, I think anyone who's experienced this author's previous works, if you like that type of stuff, you're gonna like this. And as someone who really feels like there's a missed market in terms of the Dorara vibes, I mean, honestly, give me more shows like Dead Mount Deathplay, especially when you have me questioning who the bad guys truly are, because while I can understand if the so-called hero from episode one who seemingly slayed our corpse god, Necromancer, it very well could just be he's a knight in shining armor and he's a hero, but at the same time, given what we've seen from his backstory, I also wouldn't be shocked if at some point in this story, I mean, we have this core and in fall there's another core of Dead Mount Death play. At this point, I wouldn't be shocked if this so-called hero comes into this world and they fight and it turns out he's actually not so great after all. Either way, this show has a lot going for it and I'm loving my time. Now, I do have a full live reaction available on my Patreon to episode 2 if you're interested in seeing my full uncut thoughts. This is a great episode. Very different from episode 1, of course, because episode 1 definitely makes you think one thing and then it shifts it to another. I truly was expecting that this boy was gonna just wreak havoc and carnage all across the globe. But honestly, I'm here for someone who uses a taboo magic in a world that doesn't even think magic exists, but in his previous world, it just looked like a demon that should be hunted. If he's around kids or anyone, basically that's him trying to suck the souls for necromancy, when in fact, what he was doing was he was taking care of those who no one else would take care of. And honestly, I think what they did with the first couple of minutes with this almost storybook fairy tale aesthetic with like the old filmy, filmy grain filter on top of it was such an effective way to immediately show us who he is deep down inside and why he wanted to basically at face value die to someone but then reincarnate into a peaceful world. When you're basically just looked at as a monster from your very beginning all the way to your end and the people that finally give you a chance are the ones that you've been helping giving food to and the fact that they even showed that there was like a love blossoming. I mean, the fact that he just wanted to have a normal peaceful life and then in comes the, the knights in shining armor who burn everyone at the stake and kill everyone thinking that a necromancer corrupted them and that's all there is to it. And to see just the transition from the younger skeleton into the bigger one that we fought in episode one, it just makes a lot of sense. And I love how they use that intro to get us accustomed to who he is immediately so then when the orphanage thing pops up around the end of the episode, basically the sirens go off. I'm thinking, well, how are the cops here? They didn't hear any gunshots yet. Turns out there's a building on fire where there is kind of like an underground nursery, which basically houses kids that have lost people that maybe their parents were members of the ox. So just kind of like basically kids who are in unfortunate circumstances, given their parents lifestyle, current job and anything like that. And given that we know that Corpse God here is basically someone who wants to protect those that no one else will, I mean, it's no wonder that he immediately goes over. And they had a pretty cool transition from this spot all the way to the building on fire. He basically was Spider-Man, but instead of webs, he was summoning giant skeleton arms that would come out, grab, and then propel him. I'm not gonna lie, I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, if you gave me a video game mechanic like that, I'd be playing it. I, I like going in Insomniac Spider-Man games and just swinging around the town. If you gave me like a mod like that where it's just the skeleton hands, I'd be right there playing it. And I like how what we're seeing with necromancy, which this isn't the first time it's happened. There's plenty of games, there's plenty of series that use necromancy in a way that the main character who uses it isn't actually evil. 
Sometimes the magic's misunderstood or sometimes the character just has to use it because of unforeseen circumstances, right? What we're seeing though is because he can see the dead, these evil looking spirits that are over the kids and basically the adults that were taking care of them, he pretty much says like, oh, you're their parents, you're their guardians, please help me. And then we see that these skeletons from the kids perspective, they see it as that's my dad, that's my mom, that's my guardian. From the outside world, that just looks like a weird Halloween prank, potentially. If not, oh my god, monsters are roaming the streets. And I think it's going to be fun because all he wants to do is to fit into a world. That's all he wants to do. What is the way I can do that? Now, seemingly, he's getting roped into this organization, which you would swear has the right ideas. But at the same time, you say, okay, well, they're hiring people to kill criminals. As morally questionable as that may be for some, they're killing criminals. Basically, he sent a hit after a normal kid. They confirmed that Polka was... A normal kid and that was okay so I'm interested to see the moral dilemmas that could pop up in a show like this and especially given that a character like Misaki wanted to die like I said her backstory is pretty messed up I mean they gave us two equally messed up stories so basically she saw her parents get killed before her eyes by a psychopath and then she started doing it she got the idea of like hmm I wonder if killing is something that's actually enjoyable so she killed a bunch of criminals, including the man that ruined her life. And it wasn't a simple kill like where she just stabbed repeatedly. No, they made her Yandere character art a lot more compelling because she not only recognized that she was broken and messed up and probably should die, but the fact that she used a nail gun repeatedly before taking a pull through the mouth, I mean, it was savage. It absolutely was messed up. And the fact that rather than just keeping her as that psycho Yandere love interest, instead she's like, wow... I actually just killed someone who's completely innocent and normal, I probably shouldn't exist. And I'm like, okay, I don't really remember the last time I've seen something quite like that. I thought we were just going to have the typical trope, but instead you actually made her character immediately more interesting. So now that she's been given this almost second chance, I'm actually quite interested to see what they decide to pull. Now, like I said, there is a very comfy vibe about the show as well, and that's where the kind of Dorara and even some Bakano vibes come in. Because ultimately, sometimes the way those, actually often the way the characters in these series work, is they're kind of silly, they're kind of goofy, but at the same time you can have that more mature element. And I love just seeing the goofy atmosphere about it, because this type of vibe, while there's a lot of vibes at face value similar to what Dead Mount Death Play is doing, I really feel like this author has a unique style that I find it works a lot better in their series than it does with a lot of other shows that try a similar coat of paint sort of a thing. And I'm liking it. I'm really, really enjoying this one. I said episode one was my personal favorite first episode of the season just because it was just fun for me. I'm not saying it was objectively the best across the board. I think there's shows like Heavenly Delusion or Oshinoko, which probably deserve the title. But for a personal enjoyment, Dead Mount Death Play did it for me. And episode two, while feeling drastically different than what we got in episode one, it still feels like it belongs in the episode count from what we've seen, and I'm really, really excited to continue to watch this and cover it as I'm loving my time with this. But let me know what you thought down below. Are you going to keep on watching this one with me, or are you just saying, you know what, maybe it's just not for me? Let me know down below. Be sure to drop a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe if you're new around here. Also, be sure to ring that bell, of course, so you can get notified when I upload on the channel. And like I mentioned, we do have that full live reaction available on my Patreon if you're interested. And while you're there, you can also get a video shoutout. So today, we have Jenny Liu. Calvin Atkinson, and Chemist. So I appreciate the support, everyone. Please take care and have a good one.